Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 225 for Monday, September 9th, 2019. Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show that is by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Bandzoogle at Bandzoogle.com, where promo code Gig Gab gets you 15% off your first year. We'll talk about why you want to do that shortly here. But now, for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, Paul Kent. How are you, Mr. Kent? Quite good, Mr. Hamilton. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm I'm actually looking forward to this episode. We have uh, we have three interesting topics: so, song selection and and really song deselection. I think is more the focus of that segment. Then we're going to talk about chops, and then maybe one of us will tell a story about a memorable gig. So yeah, it's good. Anything uh, exciting happening for you before we dive into any of that? Well, let me see. I had a, um, I had a fun gig, the coffee house gig that I've been doing that I put together that little band and it's, you know, fun to me because there's no rehearsal. That's one of the requirements of being in that little band. So yep. it's two of my buddies, sometimes three of my buddies from the house rockers and then Chris Breen, our friend, and then uh, another friend, a bass player, Josh Baker, who um, is just a fine player, just a really nice guy that I've just always wanted to do something with. And then, so we started these things and we do an hour ish of just songs that I think sound cool, you know, just songs that fit the vibe and the, and the instrumentation. Then I do four or five solo songs. And then the second part of it is mostly sing along songs. Uh So we do, you know, American pie and country roads and that type of stuff. And it's just a really nice feeling. People really enjoy it. You know, those songs that kind of get poo pooed by many people for being, you know, brown eyed girlish, you know, overly played type things to hear a whole room of people singing them is really kind of fun. So we just started this. It's just, it's very good for the soul and it's been a lot of fun to do. Um, Simon typically plays with me and I, so I usually have another guitar this week. He wasn't available. So I handled all the guitar duties myself, which adds another level of, of concentration for me because I'm a leading the band B singing songs that are not entirely, locked down again there's no rehearsal the guys can use charts sure and uh but it's gone we've done two of them and it's been really fun and um you know it really should be that way you should be able to have certain stuff that you can just tell people prepare on your own here's exactly the way it goes walk in ready to play it right yeah and i i know what the guys are capable of so if i say hey can you add the harmony here you know no, I just know they can do it. And so, you know, they just add it in and, and away we go. And uh, there are moments where the musicianship gets to stretch. People get solos and, you know, people get their moments to shine. But it's, uh, it's a pretty controlled process that uh, it, and the formula is working pretty well. I mean, I again, I, I even use a pad for um, lyrics on this one, never with the house rockers, but on this one I do. And um it's just a lot of fun. It's just a cool way to do it. So I had that. And then Sunday yeah, I had cha- a solo chafe acoustic. Gigs, chafe gigs were like that for, for a long time. It was just, you know, like, and monkey fist gigs too. Acoustics a little bit different. These coffee house things are, are they full electric for you or are they like I somewhere play in the acoustic, middle? acoustic. Okay. Russ plays, uh, you know, um, you know, various percussional things yep. um, along with a, he has a, he has a snare and a hi-hat, but um, I have a question for you about the chafe gigs. Yeah. I mean, it's been years, but so, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> so the whole thing about, are they restaurant? Like I've seen the video that you posted of stuff that you've been doing with Amanda. Yeah. And I just, is this scene there? Are there any venues for doing small coffee house, like cover things where the focus is on people coming to listen to the music or are you in the corner kind of background while meals are being served and there's, you know, you're, you have to get over a certain level layer certain level of volume of conversation that's happening throughout the room. Yeah, that's a good question. So chafed, uh, it was the electric version of monkey fist or vice versa, depending on how you want to look at it. I think chafed came first and then monkey fist came after. So chafed was always just like rock full out rock club gigs. Um, and, but monkey fist is the acoustic thing that I do with John and Jim from chafed. And then obviously these things I've been doing with Amanda, 
would all most of them fall into the realm of acoustic gigs. I actually have an Amanda and a full electric Amanda gig at a biker bar on Sunday. So that should be interesting. It's been, a, I love playing biker bars that, that always good crowds. <laughs> oh no. People are always like, so if, as long as it's the right kind of music, you know, people are really into it. It's always a good crowd. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, the, um, in terms of like a, a venue where people will just come for the music and sit and watch, um, there are not so much for acoustic things around here. Those are mostly relegated to the, you know, restaurant or, you know, deck overlooking a golf course kind of, you know, bar sort of thing or whatever. But, but yeah, there's always, there's always another reason for people to be there. Right. There's there. I mean, generally there's always the, the, you know, booze is served reason, but, uh, most of the acoustic gigs I do are at places where food is also served. So people will come and get a meal. Uh, but you know, there's like that place over in Manchester. It's called the dairy field where it, it, it's the one that overlooks a golf course. I don't know if you've seen pictures of me playing at that, but that's that one people that come for the music, come for the music. Right. I mean, they will also come to eat They'll be like, Oh great. I can go see monkey fist. Let's get dinner while we're there. Right. And so that, that will work out. But, um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of venues that are just for music, for acoustic stuff, not so much for electric stuff. Yes. M more on the original side than on the cover side these days. And like, especially in Portsmouth, uh, there's, there's more venues for original music than cover music. I would say in, in that regard. Yeah. 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 But, um, yeah, I don't know. There's so much here that way. I actually would ask the question, what is the value? of having acoustic music be background music. You know, it, I, it seems like it's a, it seems like it's a lose for everybody. So the person who wants to listen to the music, they'll be frustrated because they can't, you know, there's too much chatter, clinking glasses, clinking plates, conversation yep. going around them. Um, the people who are there, do they really know that it's any different than, than piped in music? Does not matter at all for the, I mean, it's cool that it, it's a, it's a working gig for somebody. Sure. But is it, is it satisfying anybody? I mean, I know when I've had those gigs, they're really frustrating to me because I can't play anything soft. I can't play anything quiet. You disappear entirely. Right. You so can't I create any mood. You can't create any, you know, vibe unless you really want to take over the room. And then you have to kind of, my experience is if you're that person who's like, all right, we're going to rock it tonight. You know, even if it's acoustic, we're going to rock it tonight. We're going to get people tapping their toes and, you're not, that's not always why you've been asked to play those gigs. And so if you do that without having an understanding with the manager of the room, you know, that it's okay to do that. I, I, I just think that there's, there's a big lack of communication. as to what the purpose is of those types of gigs. There sure are a lot of them. And I think it may just end up being that's that the venue likes to just have a sign out front that says live music. You know, maybe that's a plus for them competitively over the next place. Well, it, I but, don't think this is a binary thing. I, it, it, I, I don't think the fact that a venue serves food and has other things going on on different nights of the week means that their nights that they have live music aren't intended to be focused on intended to have the music be a focus of the evening. Right. Like, like we play the, the Thursday, those Thursday night gigs that I do with Amanda, those wing nights, m most of those turn into, they are meant to be people eating wings and watching the band. And it's very much understood that that's what that gig is. And the, the, the management knows that like, that's their goal is okay. We want this thing. And, and as I, I think, I, as I've said, the people that manage the brick house really know what they're doing. And, uh, and really focus on that. Certainly there are some acoustic gigs that are meant to be background, but to be quite honest, I don't even wind up getting called for those, let alone playing them. Uh, so yeah, I would say most, all the acoustic gigs that I do, like when I played down at the gaslight in Portsmouth and that dairy field place. And um, you know, this brick house gig that we do with Amanda, even the Margaritaville's gigs that we're doing, all of those are very much like the music is supposed to be a thing. It's not supposed to be background, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah. 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 So, 
So yeah, you can go and rock out a little bit. And so that's, it's up to you to actually know it's a noisy room. Yes. Bring your bring your stuff that will deal with a noisy room. Correct. And and win them ex- over. And expect to go to go out there and and win them over. Yeah. You be expect to be the one that's going to pour energy into it and and get it back. That's right. Ah. Yeah. I, and I guess that makes sense. So it's it's clearly <laughs> the problem is me because when I just do a or solo, or maybe the venues gig, that you have. Well, no, no. I, when I go to do a solo acoustic gig, it's pretty mellow by design. A lot ah, of finger picking stuff, right? A lot of you know mi- mid tempo or slower stuff. I have a handful of stuff, but I I don't have stuff that you know I don't have two and a half three hours of of. Uh, you know, high energy, you know, acoustic rock stuff. Yeah. That's not why I do it. And so again, that's me, but that um, makes sense. I, I, you know, it, it seems to me like jazz is a good thing for that, right? Jazz is a good thing for rooms that want to have, you know, plausible deniability. They have live music, but I mean, you know, I, so I often, actually, I would disagree with that. Any clubs that are having jazz, that's the place where, the, the focus is really on the music, at least around here. When there's people playing mm-hmm. jazz, that is not meant to be in the in the corner. That is like pe- every single person in the room has gone out of their way to go show up and see live jazz. And every note is followed. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's not meant to be. I mean, I'm sure I look, I'm sure there are those places where it's just like, oh, yeah, you know, you wallpaper in the corner. Go. But I don't hear about them. I, the, when I when I hear about people playing jazz gigs, it's like, OK, n- like you're going to people are going to be quiet while while they play and listen and pay attention. And all of the stuff that happens with like an active jazz audience, there's applause after each solo. And, you know, those that that whole dynamic is is the thing that happens. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I'll just go back to this one gig and I love it so much. The gig that I was talking about today. Yeah. I did it for a year as a solo. Right. And then just because I felt like it, I added basically an acoustic band or, you know, softer, yeah. softer, you know, uh, there is one horn. He doesn't get mic he, you know, saxophone. Yep. But this, this venue is awesome and, and it's fun to play and people are focused on you. And, you know, some of the guys that I've had sit in, they remark, it's like just so nice to be able to express musically and have people dig what you're doing and get what you're doing without, you know, having to be a full, you know, hundred decibel band. I don't understand why more places don't do it. I don't understand why Starbucks hasn't institutionalized music featuring local musicians, you know, all over the country and creating thousands and thousands of music jobs. It just seems like it goes really well together if it's, if it's the right vibe for the right venue. And, you know, I think Starbucks, certainly you know most of them have the room and um and uh, people hang out there and people want to hang out there so it it seems like there should be more and not just to pick on starbucks i don't understand why any of the other dozens of independent coffee shops this is a this is a flat remarkable success that this has i mean the room is filled almost every night people are enjoying it it's fun for the artist to bring you know it doesn't take that much to fill it tips usually meet or exceed the pay for the night because yep. people are so in, and again they're tipping because they're watching and they know what they're tipping they, because right? they yeah because they're appreciating this this thing that they're getting yeah. yeah well you know if that's not happening in your area and you want it to happen go make it happen like mm. you know it is a thing it works at the, with the right place but if you're seasoned enough you've played enough gigs you can kind of walk into a place and know yeah this one yeah you know what i think this could work here and go pitch it to the management say hey look you know i'll i'll do the first one you know cut a deal and say look i want to pave this way with you i think this is what it's worth this is what i should get paid to do it here i'll because i know that you're t- taking a flyer too you know, I'll do the the first one for, you know, half of X to prove to you the concept and then off we go or something to entice them, you know, into it. Like I'll do three gigs for the price of four, what, like whatever it is, you know, right. can make a thing. And because because you have to do it more than once, that's really the trick. If you just do it once, it, it that's not enough to create a. Uh, a pattern that people will come and and watch. Right. So you got to tell them and maybe you do the first, you know, six for the price of three or something like that, where you say, like, look, I, I want to make this happen. So let's do it once a month for six months and let's try this out or, you know, whatever they they're going to do. I mean, really, they should 
if they're going to do it, it should be happening, you know, more frequently than once a month so that it actually becomes a pattern, but something like that and see what you can, you know, see what you can work out because mm. it like, there's an opportunity there. And that to me, that's the kind of scenario where it makes sense to take, you know, less than market rate, right? If you can work something out where you're def- and this is something we, you know, learned from the ad sales business, but never lower your rate offer bonuses, Right. Mm-hmm. So if your rate is, you know, if you're doing an acoustic gig and, and everywhere else there's acoustic gigs, it's 200 bucks. Great. Tell them, OK, I'll, I'll do this, you know, a solo acoustic gig for 200 bucks. I'll play, you know, three hours with whatever one break or however many breaks you think you should have. Like sort that all out and say, because this is a new thing for you, I'll do, you know, the first six of them for 600 bucks. And that way you're getting you buy three, get three free kind of thing. And, and we'll we'll pave this path together because that way, when it does work out, you're still at 200 bucks a gig for your, um, you know, when it when when renewal comes around. Right, so, right, right. Yep. So I, I, I to me, I think that's a really smart thing. I know, um, you know, I, and I'm certainly in this group. There's many of us that get jumpy when people start taking gigs for less money than than the going market rate. Uh, but I, I think in that scenario, if you're creating a venue, I think people give you a pass. I give you a pass. So there you go. That market I rate is also an interesting discussion because and to me, that's a very moving target. I mean, of course, I think, I think a minimum is a good thing, but mm. I think there, there are all these mixes of, you know, quality, quality of venue, you know, future opportunities. Yes. Um, you know, I think a minimum is right. Yeah, a minute. Mean, that's probably a better a better term to use. Yeah, market rate is, is yep. probably a bit of a misnomer, but yeah, just don't do it. Does Fling have a minimum? Uh, our, generally, our minimum with Fling is a hundred bucks a man. Like, there's no reason, and and that has it. Most of us in Fling, most of the time, most of us in Fling are not doing it for the money. I don't want to paint anybody's personal picture, yeah. but but generally speaking, we do. You know, we play Fling gigs because we like to, and the same is true of Monkey Fist and. Um, even the Amanda, but you do have that minimum, which I think is a respect. That, I, I mean, that's the essence of everything we've talked about here for three yeah, years, right? right? It's like, right? It's like you can't just give it away because you like to do it. You know, there there are other factors at play. There are guys who do it for a living here, and you know, absolutely. So, a be good to so the quality of music in your scene is good, but b value it. You have to value what you do. If you give it away, then it doesn't have any value, right? Well, and then the other thing is, we've found over the years because certainly when you know, Fling was not created as a band to gig. It was just a bunch of guys getting together in Russ's basement, writing songs and playing some covers every now and then. And I got roped into it when we moved here. I mean, it happily got roped into it. Uh, when we moved here, our Russ's wife and, and Lisa met at a actually at a mommy and me yoga class or something. And <laughs> somehow they started talking about how their husbands were musicians and we were new to the area. And Russ's wife was like, oh, I, you know, Dave should come over and play, which is kind of a weird thing for her to do to Russ. But thank goodness she did. <laughs> uh, but, and so I did. And I, it happened that I showed up on a night when the Steve, the guy that was normally playing drums with them wasn't there. So it was like, Oh, even better. Okay, cool. So this isn't awkward at all. And, uh, or it's only mildly awkward <laughs> and, and obviously things worked out, but it was, I was probably in fling for two years before fling played its first gig. Um, but it, for me, it was bowling night to meet, you know, yeah. local people. Right. And then, but when fling started gigging the, you know, the, the bookings weren't happening from someone that was seasoned and and so it like we we got there it was very quickly but you know there were some gigs where it was like 12 bucks and nachos or whatever let's go play <laughs> and i was like oh okay guys fine i'll go and i remember that argument though would you rather sit home or would you rather go do something fun well, i remember that but, argument and, and that's a good rationalization rationalization of the time until you understand the bigger picture well but the bigger picture is that that was not actually the option it wasn't sit home or go do something fun it was sit home or go and play a gig somewhere that's only willing to pay $12 and nachos. And as it turns out, 100% of the time, the people that can't run their businesses such that they make enough from live music to pay that $100 a man or 500 bucks a band or whatever it works out to be are generally the people that don't offer you a fun gig. So sitting on the couch would have actually been a better option a hundred percent of the ways other than you get an interesting story and you know, you can rant about it on your podcast, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, 
I, I yeah, those were not fun gigs. They were awful. The the load in was never right. You felt like you were you were treated like we were treated like we were in the way. Uh, it, you know, it was it was like they were doing us a favor to let us sit up in their corner and play, but not too loud. And don't it's like that old saying when people tell you who they are, believe them. Correct. <laughs> believe them. Yeah. And by offering you twelve dollars and free nachos, uh, you know, <laughs> that they're telling you who they are. And yeah. and and we learned very quick. I had forgotten, you know, it had been. I think the last time I did a gig for twelve dollars in nachos, I was probably sixteen years old or something. And and I at the time I didn't think it was awful because it was like cool. I got to bring my drum somewhere and play. And but did the people hate us? Well, who cares? You know, it's fine. Mm. We're rock musicians. It's it's good. But um, but yeah, it was like oh right, this is why we do the hundred dollar a man thing in every other band I've ever been in since then, or whatever the market minimum is. You know, in Austin when I was there, it was actually fifty bucks a man was the market minimum. Minimum, but um. But pretty much everywhere else I've been, it's been 100, I think. So, but, you know, you have that for good reason, because sure. it's a litmus test. If somebody can't afford to pay that, walk away, walk away. James, the James gang said it best. Walk away. Walk away. Hey, I want to talk about uh, band Zoogle, if that's cool by please. you, man. Yeah, please love them. So you're, you've got a band. You need a website because you want a, a place where people can come and find out about your gigs but also can buy your music and your merch and subscribe to your mailing list and crowdfund everything that you want to do and all of that stuff. Well, do you want to have to create a website from scratch out of whole cloth? If you do, that's cool. But chances are, even if you know how to do that, you don't actually want to do it. And that's what Banzoogle is for because it is built by musicians for musicians. They have these this engine, it's like one big engine that has all these moving parts that allows you to create your website for you. Like it's not a Banzoogle site. It is your website and they manage everything. And it's awesome because they make it super easy. They've got support seven days a week and plans start at just eight dollars and twenty nine cents a month. That includes the all the hosting and your own free custom domain name. Right. So this is really how you want to do it. Merch and download stores all are commission free right there. Like I said, they've got a new crowdfunding feature also commission free. Right. All the funds that you get from all your pledges go directly to your account without delay. <clears throat> Let me point out that that's an important thing. Right. Sure. And, and you can have fan subscriptions, too, so that if people just want to donate to you on a regular basis, they can do that. And they can get different at rewards and you can put that whole thing together and plans just start at $8 and 29 cents a month to do that. You're going to go to bandzoogle.com. They give you a 30 day free trial and then make sure to use our promo code, which is the name of the show gig gab. So there's three G's, two of them together. One's at the beginning, G I G G A B. And that gets you 15% off your first year of any subscription. So bandzoogle.com promo code gig gab and build your website and your electronic press kit today, and you're going to love it. You use it. It's freaking awesome. I love it. I do love it. It really is. It's, it's, it's almost the perfect service. The variety of options you have for how you can make your band look, it always makes you look modern and always looks you. If, if your website is the main thing that you use to get people to understand about whether they should hire you for something outside of seeing you live, it's just a fantastic service. And all of the widgets, you know, all of the um, ancillary services just make the experience that much better. All the stuff about how to post videos and how to post, how to post, you know, fan supported content, sell merchandise, everything. It's just an awesome service. Sweet. So check it out. Banzoogle.com promo code GigGab to get 15% off your first year of any subscription. Our thanks to Banzoogle, of course, for sponsoring this episode. Thanks, All Banzoogle. Right. Thanks, Banzoogle. Yeah. All right, man. Hey, uh, you had an interesting topic and and actually, it, it, this this has come up a few times, but there's the song that somebody brings in, and it's poo pooed by somebody else. And this is always an interesting thing, right? And I found myself poo pooing a song. You're going to be shocked at to what as to what song it was that I was poo pooing that somebody else brought in uh, to a fling rehearsal last week, and it was a fish song. Believe it or not, I'm I'm a fish mm. fan. Yep. And it's a song called Chalk Dust Torture. One of the guys in the band was like, I think we could play that really well. And I'm like, actually, I, I don't disagree. Uh, and so we came to rehearsal and 
as it turned out, I was the only one that knew the song. <laughs> and I like did the you other, have to rehearse it or did you just know the song? Oh no, no, I I know the song. Yeah. I've actually played this song. I played it uh when I auditioned with Dave Bruniak, uh one who was thinking of re reforming his band The Freaks before he joined um Pink Talking Fish years and years ago. But so I had played it before, but it's a it's a pretty straight ahead rocker, but I've also heard it heard Fish play it, you know, dozens of times or whatever. It's it's actually one of my favorite fish songs. It's just a rocker, but it's got some moments in it that require some nuance and you have to know the song. And that's when it hit me. I have never very rarely brought in a song, a cover song to any band that I'm in. If that cover song is by a band that I that I like or go see or anything like that. And the reason is I know that this is an exercise fraught in disappointment, right? I know this song the way that band does it. I, I actually kind of like it the way that band does it. And I also know very well that any other band is going to play this song differently. Now, sometimes another band can play that song. It could be my band. It could be someone else's band. And they're going to play it well in an interesting way that actually has merit. And that's great. But the only way that actually happens is when someone is when the band knows the song, right? If the band doesn't know the song, then it's not going to happen. And, you know, we play a couple of fish tunes in uh, in fling, but I didn't bring in either one of them. Uh, you know, Burke brought in this tune sample in a jar. I don't think he even realized. I think he, he had heard the Little Feet cover of it and um, and I think he, he thought it was a Little Feet tune. It was like, oh, actually, that's a fish song. And, you know, Fling plays it Fling's way. It's not like, it's not like Little Feet. It's not like Fish. I mean, it's it's somewhere in between plus a, you know, plus our own little thing. But we play it well and it's good. Um, It is, but it came in with other people knowing this tune, right? And it wasn't me trying to drive the bus on this song. It was just like, okay, great. Yeah. You guys know it. Let's play it. I know it too. Whereas with now with I'm going to pause you right here because the, here's the thing that would go through my mind if it was my situation. Yep. Were you excited to have someone bring in a song from the artist that you love, or were you like, well, if we're going to go there, why don't we do this? Right? Like, here's a better one. Like knowing, you know, you you go gingerly into repping your favorite artist songs in your band. I know sure. in my band, I brought so many Springsteen songs in. Uh, with mixed results, you know, yep. some of them I love, some of them are disappointing, like you said. But um, at that point in there, when someone brought it in, we were like, this is interesting. You know, let's see what he's where, where he's going to go with this. Or were you like, all right, guys, well, if we're talking about this, you know, here's the challenges with this song. But I'm an expert on this. Maybe we should go over here. Um, no, I, 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 well, I have no designs on turning fling into like a fish cover band or a rush cover band or an REM cover, you know, or any of those bands that I would like where the material actually, you know, means something to me. Right. Uh, so when, when, uh, when it was, you know, suggested that we play this song, I was like, okay, yeah. Like I can, I can see fling actually playing that song. Well, uh, if fling chooses to learn that song, just like it's, mm. which is, is true of any song that is brought in. Right. But when we started going through it and it was like, oh, OK, well, you know, are you going to sing it? I'm like, well, I, I didn't bring it in. I don't need to sing it. You know, that's that's fine. I'll just play it. And it's like, oh, well, I don't know the lyrics. OK. Do you know the melody? No. OK. Do you know like that riff that connects the the <laughs> chorus to the outro? No. OK. So do you know the intro riff? Well, not really. OK. So. Like I'm the only one in the room that knows the song. <laughs> it was like, yeah, I don't think this is a good idea for us to do because unless you guys want to learn it, and that's really the difference, right? If there's a desire from multiple people in the band to like, okay, yeah, like I, now that I've heard this song, now I want to sink my teeth into it. And this may happen still with this song. It, this, th there is a formula in fling where we will, sort of, you know, pepper a song in, we'll mess with it a little bit to see if we learned it, would this go somewhere? We've sort of learned how to vet a song that way. And I'll, I'll be curious to see if it comes back up at a future rehearsal. I don't think it will, um, but it might. And that has, that has happened with other songs, not, not necessarily fish tunes, but you know, anything that comes in, it's like, we'll mess with it. And then there needs to be critical mass in terms of the people in the band 
learning it and wanting to play it. Uh, anytime one person has sort of driven the bus on a particular song and it doesn't matter if it's me or anybody else in the band, it winds up just being a huge colossal waste of time and a a source of massive frustration, (laughs) right? Because I don't want to be the one driving this song. I don't mind driving the bus on this song if everybody else is on board, but But you're not going to spend any intellectual capital on this one. No, you know, there's other things that you would rather do it on. Correct. And, and honestly, not your song. It's not, my, choice. it's not my song. Right. And and uh, Mike, our guitar player, actually wrote a song a couple of years ago that reminds me of of Chalk Dust Torture. It's it's similar in its form. I don't think it was intentionally. I don't even know if he had heard Chalk Dust Torture before he he wrote this song called Try Me On. But it's a great song. It it sort of serves a similar purpose in the set. It's just a you know guitar driven rocker kind of thing. And uh, and I think Fling would be better served to play that song a hundred percent of the time than we would trying to cover, you know, chalk dust. Sure. It's, it's our, it's our song first of all. So we can, you know, it's never wrong. We get to, you know, it's us. So like to me, that's all if, and, and if fish songs in general are going to be obscure songs there, there's usually one person in the room, right? No matter where we are, there's one person in the room that like knows fish's catalog, but in, in addition to me, Right. And and that person's always really happy whenever we, you know, break out a fish tune. But if it's it's how many people are happy by the end of those songs. Right. Yeah. And and a lot with with like that, that tune sample in a jar by the end of that tune, the entire club every time is like, holy crap, you guys tore. What song is that? Is that one of yours? Right. Like it, it gets people's attention. I'm it, that could happen with any song. But the band, mm-hmm. the whole band needs to be committed and playing it. Otherwise, if we're going to do something obscure, why do why make it a cover? Why not just make it one of our originals? And that's right. You know, like there's there's no. If you're going to use that one slot in the set list for something that's out there. Why not? You know, do what's the best benefit? You what's can the get from best using use that of that time? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. This is. I don't see. And and I I don't mean to preach this as you know the only gospel, but my gospel is, I don't see any point in going out and playing vanity songs right the, the the to to borrow your term cover songs that i'm the only one in the room that knows and it means something to me and no one else on on stage or you know in the crowd cares about this song i i i just don't see the value in putting all the energy and like you said devoting that slot in the set to to doing that it's like uh, you know i don't need to Pretend I'm in that band. Yeah. I'm in my band. So I want to talk about that, that poo pooing thing. So it, yeah. the message there is, at least in my band, it sounds like in your band, the best success songs are ones that have complete buy in and it's a no brainer for everybody. Doesn't mean it's necessarily the biggest hit that you could bring in, but it's a, it's a song that resonates with everybody. And yep. I, I think that. With cover bands, often there's a huge value if people have a similar musical dictionary. If people's frame of reference of what music they like crosses over quite a bit, Absolutely. that's a really valuable asset, right? Yep. Now, it doesn't mean that you know musicians with, with vastly disparate tastes can't find their way to doing something special. Of course they can. But I just find that um, there's something about you know interpreting and communicating to everybody's satisfaction that gets a whole band excited about stuff is when people have a similar musical dictionary. So that said, you bring in a song and, you know, as we talked about, you have different levels of personality in your band. You have guys who are like, just tell me what to play and I'll play it. And they're there to be in a band. You have guys who who feel that they have a, 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 a qualitative uh, perception on things that is, you know, depending on who they are, equal, less than or greater than the other people's qualitative perspective on things. Sure. It, th- there's all those types of things, but I do know that once a song is brought in, at least in my band, if there's someone who raises their eyebrow about it or speaks up about it early on or, or expresses any kind of negative, it's an uphill battle to get that song successful. Even if they're, you know, and, and I'm, there's no one in my band who would raise that and not give it their all. But what happens is from the first poo poo, then the other guys in the band who might speak up less are like, oh, here we go again. Or like, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. maybe, or maybe he's right. Or do, you know, does he have a point or, you know, whatever it could be. But that song now has some baggage associated with it. And I have had songs where 
I know in my heart it's a good song for me to sing, a good song for us to play, a good song for our show, and I've stuck with it. But over the years, early on, if someone said no to a song I said yes to, I was determined that it had to work. Oh. Now I'm much more selective about it. It's not as much of an ego, yeah, you know, type of thing to prove myself right. Yeah, it is a lesson. I mean, I you know, I get frustrated with it when I find myself in that scenario where there's somebody just like beating the horse of a song that I, I am fairly certain isn't going to work. You know, it's, or or even worse, we've proven isn't going to work. Right? Like it's it. We could spend you know if we've spent let's say five hours on a song and it's like, okay, it would take another 15 to get this anywhere. And it would take everybody's buy-in plus 15 hours. It's like, mm. I, I don't like, I, I will hit my, I'm an impatient cat. Right. So <laughs> I will, I will notice myself getting very frustrated very quickly with that. And sometimes I'm proven wrong by the way, you know, like I'm, I just cause I know I'm right. Doesn't mean I'm actually right. And so like, there have been things where it's like, like when Burke brought in pretzel logic, I was like, Oh dude, there's no freaking way like, that this song's going to work. And now that's one of those tunes. It doesn't matter if anyone in the room knows that song uh, by the end of it, they love what they just heard. Right. It yeah. like, it works so well. And, and so that's great. Like I, 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 I love being proven wrong that way. That's awesome. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. But, but I, you know, I, I, and this is, this is where I'm going to sound like, you know, the, in my day, but I've been through that. Right. I played in bands when I was in high school and college and stuff. And I've, I've, I've gotten over that thing you were talking about where it's like, no, this song means a lot to me. We have to play it. We will make it work. That whole thing I've learned is most of the time a fool's errand. Right. So it's like, OK, well, let's just not even go down that path. But because I know that now I expect everybody else to know that. And I know that's unreasonable to expect everybody yeah. to think the way I do. But but that's what happens. And it's like, oh, why are we wasting our time with this? And I try to get out of my head and, and you know, commit and play and and. Again, you know, there have been times where I have gotten out of my head and committed and played and, you know, then it's great. And I really can. Like once we start playing a song, especially in rehearsal, I I can I can pretty much put anything aside because I just I like to play. Right. Yeah. So it's fine. It's all. Good. And what you're saying is actually really interesting because in that is a certain amount of ego driven um, pride. Yes. Right? Yes. That is involved with either the the promotion or the demotion of a song. And I, I think that's right. I mean, if you're in a band that you like playing in and you like the guys you're in, you can find your way out of that out yes. of that hole pretty easy and just say, look, look, I'm going to play. Let's see what happens. You know, I the one thing I do know is my whole band is on the same page about things that don't work. I mean, when it's clear that, you know, time in for re for reward isn't paying back, guys will back off of their position pretty quickly. And, you know, just, you know, it, that's all a good, the guys in my band. That might be the most important differentiator in having a successful working band is everyone sharing that sense of, OK, wait, wait, this is going wrong. Stop. Don't waste. Well, time. actually, I'm, I'll throw you a curveball on this because we're, here's sure? where I feel this conversation goes. Yeah. Um, we have, we're playing a wedding this weekend and um, there were three special requested songs. One of them, we only play at weddings celebration by cool and the gang. Oh, nice. Yeah. And um, then there were two other special songs and it's been busy. We have other things going on. We're all kind of tired, you know, from, from a very busy schedule. I sent the guys the links and I said, you come prepared exactly with these songs because we're going to play them at the wedding. We're not, we'll rehearse them at soundcheck, but we don't have much time to clean them up. So you got to be ready. Yeah. Learn it like and, that. When Gary sends us those, it's exactly the same thing. And it's for those of you that haven't done weddings yet or ever and don't plan to, that's okay. But it, the three songs, you know, is a pretty normal thing. And, right. and, and Gary does the same thing you did. It's like, here is the version that we will play at the wedding. It's usually a link to a YouTube video. It's like, come yep. ready to be a play, pro play that version. Yep. Go. Yep. In that key. Yep. Be a pro come prepared and y you don't have any time to, you know, no, nope. there's no opinion. I also know on this. Yeah. That's right. I also know my guys can handle all three of the songs. Sure. I know without problem. Um, and the point of all this is, it gets to be an issue of time. So we're saying that we, that we are a good, a good characteristic of a successful band is a band who knows when to punt on something. Yep. But to me now, 
after 20 years, after seeing vanity songs, you know, can't miss songs. The issue to me is time in on the front end. Yep. And, uh, you know, having this coffee band that I coffee house band, I told you about, which is basically that I send them the links and I say, come ready to play. You don't have to play it exactly like this, but the form is like this and, you know, follow the leader and, you know, we'll get through yeah. everything. And yeah. it, you know, that uh, is really comfortable songs. We had one song that was took about four weeks and we still weren't four weeks of rehearsal. And we still weren't done with it. And then someone else brought in one song that we, that we nailed the first time through and Russ, you know, said, you know, that one long song is worth 25 of the short songs. You know, what would you rather have? And, you know, there to me as a leader, A, I want to give guys a chance to, if you bring in a song, it's going to take some time. I want to give guys a chance to have, you know, the emotional win of, of succeeding at something. Yep. I also want to be respectful of everybody else's time. And I, I think that that thing in the front end is how efficient you dole out the creative rewards, you know, system. Mm. I have one guy in my band who thrives on complexity. He thrives on complex arrangements. He thrives on, you know, making subtle changes to things that make it better. Uh, and he picks, he picks harder songs as well. Um, um, but we've gotten some tremendous wins from that. Yep. And some long invested losses. Right. Yep. <laughs> so many weeks in many weeks in with nothing to show. Right. Yep. So, but we've gotten some tremendous wins for that. Um, and I want that guy to keep bringing me big wins. So I want to, I don't want to discourage him from bringing cool things that we can do something cool with. The question is, is can we have better conversations that, that, tilt our investments more towards the wins than the, you know, than the who knows. Right. So. Yeah, that's, well, the, the trick is learning. Better learning how to identify what will be a win, right? Like what are the, what are the indicators, the, the early indicators of, you know, those first two rehearsals with the song, as opposed to the seventh and eighth rehearsals with the song, what are the indicators there that leads you to think, oh, wait a minute, this might actually be worth the time, you know, and I mean, that's that that's not an easy thing to suss out. Right. But yeah, but the bands that can do that are the ones that can be really efficient with their time and say, ah, yeah, I see where this one's going. We should let's buckle down. Let's let's work on that transition to the chorus so that we get that right. Let's come back next week. Let's see what we can do with this thing. I think there's hope. Right. You yeah. know, like that. That kind of thing is great, but it's not easy by, I mean, I, it's easy to talk about in the abstract yes. here, yes. <laughs> but that it's not, it's not easy. And even and the worst part is once you've had, you know, a handful of wins and a handful of losses and you start to believe that, you know, how to identify these things and then get yourself proven wrong, which will inevitably happen. At least it does. If you're me, um, you know, then it's like, okay, well, I can't trust my gut necessarily on these because is my gut informing me because I don't like this song or because I do like this song or, you know, like who know or because I had a bad day at work or a good day at work. Like, what's the reason that my gut saying punt and, you know, really thinking critically about that? Like, no, I know this band. We can do this. Or uh, remember that other time we tried that song that was like this? I don't know, guys, you know, like what what's different this time? And sometimes that's the, the right question to ask is, OK. What's going to be different this time? We tried, you know, song A. Now we're trying song B. What can we do here to ensure success? Like, you yeah. know, and it might be one guy saying, oh, you know what? On song A, I, I never looked at it, you know, when when we had three weeks or whatever. The only place I was looking at it was here in the rehearsal room. If he says, oh, yeah, that's on me. You know what? On this one. Let, let's see how it is next week. Give me a chance here. I, I'll, you know, I'll be the one. And sometimes I'm that guy, you know, it's like, ah, you know, I gotta, I can't just show up and, and trust my, you know, decades of experience to carry me through on a song like this. I actually need to woodshed it, you know? So like, yep. Thought, let me see what I can do. Go from there. Yeah. It's interesting. It's fun. But being, being that conservative with time, I'm actually, I, I personally am a little burnt out from everything from a really busy summer and the idea of going back into, you know, three, four hour rehearsals once a week and going through that process. I'm just not ready for it right now. Right. Yeah. We've you got, need a month or got two. A, we've yeah. Got a, yeah. We've got a ton of material. You know, we, our shows are fresh mostly every, every night, but you know, 
I I like that feeling when I miss the guys and I want to dig in and you know be creative with everybody. And so I, I need that to kind of come back. But right now, if I had if I had a song, you know, that I knew was gonna take, you know, four rehearsals, painful rehearsals, um, and still be a risk, that would be a tough one for me. That's t- yeah, yeah, that right, right. Time of And I, I'm guilty of I I brought in one that drove us freaking crazy. You know the song I just want to celebrate by Rare Earth? Oh yeah. Great song. Weird song, though. Weird song. Not easy to play well. And you know what? Here's the thing. I brought it in and Russ was the first to say, oh, yeah, I've come across the song a few times. It's not an easy one to pull off. And I was kind of listening to it. And, you know, you know, you have that half rationalization engine where you really really want it to work. So you're kind of hearing it like, well, we can kind of make it our own here, here, here. And then all of a sudden the guy has the, you know, crazy range on some of the, you know, higher notes that he goes for the, the, um, the, the, the form of it is a little bit weird. And it's it's a very sparse tune. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, it, it, and that's, those are harder to play than the dense songs. I think for sure. Cause yeah, well, because the, all your mistakes hang out right there. In the, well, And the vibe the of it is so like the vibe of a song is defined by the people playing it. Right. And so like you can hide that with lots of notes, but when it's a tune like that, that's just sort of, you know, loosey goosey and hanging out there. If your band isn't the exact right kind of band to play that song, That's it's so true. It's not going to sound that way. It, you you know, it's never going to sound like it does, right? In in the it, it, it's never going to sound like Rare Earth doing it. So what you know, what is it about your band that makes that work? Is really the For question. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's you know, in my mind, I'm hearing twenty thousand people singing. I just want to celebrate, right? And, yes. and it makes a moment for people. Yes. But the devil's in the details, and you know, actually getting it done, very, very hard. I always so say that, you know, that was my last that you know me being guilty of pushing an agenda on a song that I really believed in. And, you know, at the end of the time, I spent a lot of social capital in my band trying to win this song through, trying to will this th- song through. And we came up empty handed. It's not going to happen. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It. Yeah. Yep. It happened. Mm-hmm. And it will continue to happen. Right. You know, the the problem is when you start and I noticed this when we were playing Chuck Dust Torture here uh, last week, you know, trying to rehearse it. I'm playing along with the radio in my head, not the band in the room. It's like, mm. okay, wait a minute. Turn off the radio in my head. What's the band in the room sound like? Oh, sure. no, this isn't working. You, you know, like the, there's so much of this that is not even close that we need to we need to table this until someone else actually learns it and brings it in and can be the one to drive the bus. I can happily co-pilot that bus, <laughs> but I cannot be the only one that knows how to drive this song. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the deal is you got to get a song and you got to get everybody as a co-pilot. Some buy-in. That's, that's the goal. Right. The that's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. <sighs> I didn't want to celebrate at the end of that experience. No, no. <laughs> well, sometimes that's how it goes, you know? So, but there you go. So, uh, do you want to have this chops conversation, man? Um, let's save it for next time. Cause okay. I think it'll, it'll expand out because it's a good thing. And actually we should spend some time out. I, I want to see if I can get James Robinson back involved okay. and just to set it up for everybody. The concept is, you know, most of us who are in a band have reached a certain level of proficiency. The question is how many people invest in trying to take their chops to a better level. You maybe work better at learning a certain song or, you know, or, or, you know, tackling more difficult songs, but how many musicians up level their chops once you're in kind of an ongoing working thing, given time constraints, bad habits, you know, being in ruts that all musicians get into. I just wanted to expand and take a good look. And, you know, we have a friend who's a, a music teacher who had some deep thoughts on this. I'm going to see if I can get him involved and we can talk about chops next time. OK, cool. That'd be great. Sounds like a winner. Sounds like a winner. You got anything else to go through today, man? I just would love for everybody to always be performing. Always, always be performing. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the trick, isn't it? Because without that, we got nothing. Got to do it. You got to perform. Yeah. Without love, where would you be now? Uh, who could it be now? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Ben Zoogle for sponsoring this episode. Good stuff. Go check them out. See you next time. Later, Dave.